My name is David, and I'm one of the pastors here, and I'm glad y'all are with us, but nobody's with us. I'm talking to an empty room. Uh, we had a family dinner on Monday. We tried to record it, and we had some technical difficulties, so we weren't able to. So I'm going to try as best I can to not necessarily recreate, but at least summarize what was said. A little tricky. We had five different people sharing. We probably talked for about an hour. I'm going to try to do less than that and, and grab the thoughts of those four other folks. So this may feel a little bit choppy, but we'll just do the best we can. If you have any questions about anything that's being shared, just email me directly, david at stonebridgemarietta.org, and I'll do my best to, to fill you in on anything that you might have missed or anything, any confusion that this um, presentation creates. So in general, what, what we were trying to do, and what we are trying to do, is get us as a body on the same page with some tension that we're feeling, and that tension is being created by what we would say are two good gifts. So when I say we, uh, I think I'm speaking collectively for the body, but I'm certainly speaking for our staff and our admin team. Our admin team is uh, Mark Hunt, Erica Fulgham, Pam Downs, John Putman, Ben Ferris. They help in all things organizational and operational. Three major areas are facilities, staffing, and budget. And a lot of what we'll be sharing bleeds into those areas. So when I say we, uh, it's a collective we, and certainly speaking again for the, for the staff and the admin team. Anyway, two good gifts. And so the tension created by that. One good gift is this building, and it is a good gift, and it's always been a good gift, and we would say that God gave it to us, we, I and mean, we had to pay for it, but uh, he has given us this building. It, it came to us as a gift. We weren't necessarily looking to, to buy when we got a phone call from the man who owned this building to see if we were interested, and our staff and our admin team prayed, and we walked through, and we had peace, which was, which was uh, the first time we'd ever experienced collectively peace when we'd walked through a building. We looked at some other places before, but it never sat right with everybody, and, and this one did. And then we presented it to the congregation. People had an opportunity to pray and, and walk through, and again, the same. It wasn't unanimous. I think we had maybe response from around 100 folks, I think, and four, four negatives, I think. But the rest were positive. Everybody said, yeah, this feels good to us. And so we continued to move forward. Objectively, we needed a, a, a large down payment, two and a half million dollars, and we had about six months to get it. And the reason we wanted that big of a down payment was we wanted the mortgage on this building to be in line with the rent we were paying on the square. We didn't want to move in here and suddenly need to start asking people to give a, a lot more money, or we didn't want to have to grow in order to meet our monthly obligations. And so two and a half million was what we needed to put down. And so we just, we put it out there and said, hey, this is what we need. And People committed 2.52 million, which was a green light, and then a, a greener light. What actually came in was closer to 2.8 million, which that's pretty unusual to bring in more than is committed. So all of that was to us. It was God's blessing, favor, gift, however you want to say that. This building was a gift to us, and it has been. We've been able to do more ministry with more people over the last four years than we ever could have done on the square. So hear me loud and clear. This building is a gift from God. Second gift is increased in attendance. And that increase has been larger and more rapid than we anticipated. And that's also a gift. Again, speaking certainly for staff and admin team, and I think probably speaking collectively for everyone, every child, student, and adult who comes into this place, we, we say, they're a gift from God. There's plenty of places God could have sent or people could have gone, and they're choosing to come here or, and or he's sending them here, however you want to see that happening. And our desire is to create a space where everybody feels welcome, where people can connect with the Lord, and where they can grow in their relationship with Jesus. And this, the growth, though, it's just been more than we anticipated. You know, when we moved in, we, we, we thought it through as best we could. We had, I don't know, maybe 225 seats on the square. We, 350 is what we thought we could put in this room. So we knew there could be a time where maybe this building became a little bit constricting. But based on our history, we thought we would have seven, seven years before we would need to add a third service. Our, our growth rate at that point, you know, looking back from 2014 to 2019, it was 8% growth rate. We were adding 26 people a year. And so we thought, well, if we continue that, 
COVID kind of, we moved in 2020, so kind of take out the COVID year. So start in the fall, or the, excuse me, the summer of 2021, that's really when we opened back up fully. Seven years from that would have been sometime in 2028, we would have had to add a third service. That's obviously not what happened. We added a third service in the summer of 2023. Our growth rate has been significantly higher than it ever has been in our history. Our average growth rate over the last uh, several years from 21 to 22, 22 to 23, and 23 to 24 has been 23%. We've averaged 104 more people per year in this room. And to be clear, when we're talking about people in the room, that's middle school, high school, and adults. We do pull the middle school out, but they're in here for half the service, and so they need a seat. So when we're talking about people in the room, it's everybody 12 and up. And we've added, uh, on average, 104 people per year over the last three years. And so it's that good gift of people is kind of bumping up against the good gift of this building and the, the confines of what it is. And that kind of brings us to where we are right now, which is there, there, there's a current tension and there's a potential future tension. And so the future tension um, is we could easily bump into the limits of this building in the next, you know, eight, 18 months or so. If we grow in 2025 at the same rate, just number of people, not even percentage rate, but if we just, if we add another 100 people in this room in 2025, that's gonna push us up around 800 on a Sunday. And for me, that's our, I'll call it our realistic capacity. Um, it's not our actual capacity. We actually have 390 chairs in here and 390 times three is 1170. So that's how many people can fit in this room on a Sunday, 1170. We're not even close to that. But I also don't know that we ever get close to that. Again, thinking realistically, one of our services is at eight in the morning. I don't see us ever having 390 people showing up at eight in the morning. I would love it if we could have 150 people coming consistently at eight in the morning. There's some PowerPoints that are running behind me. I'm sure you've already seen some and you'll, you'll see the average attendance uh, for each service in that the eight o'clock, like there's plenty of room to grow, but we also know that's not necessarily the greatest time for tons of people. Anyone who comes at eight, we are so grateful for you doing that. Seriously, you're, you're, you're allowing all of this to happen. Your willingness to come at eight on a consistent basis is really, in a lot of ways, saving is a strong word, but that's kind of what you're doing. You're, you're creating space at those second two services that we wouldn't have otherwise. And so very practically, if you wanna skip to the end, what's a practical next step would be you, your family praying and considering moving to eight o'clock. That would, that would be huge for us. So anyway, my, my thinking is maybe we can get 150 consistently at eight. Then those second two services, if we could consistently have around 325, that adds up to 800 people. You may say, well, 325, you said 390. In church world, you've probably heard this, if a room is 80% full, it feels full, and you've maybe experienced this. If you've come in a little bit late, particularly if we're already standing up for worship, it's very difficult to find a seat. Um, and if you're coming in with two people or three people or four people, if once we cross about 320 people, it's very, you're, you're probably not gonna find three seats together. And so that doesn't necessarily feel welcoming. That's the whole idea of a, it feels full, even though there are seats scattered around. So in my mind, I'm thinking 150 at eight and 325 at um, at 9.30 and 11.15, that's 800. That's, that's our realistic capacity. And if just, again, data point, uh, I think it's 14 times this year we've been over that 80% number at 9.30, and 12 times we've been over that 80% number at 11.15. So that, that's not, it's not necessarily a theoretical possibility. It's something we're currently encountering. They're not counting Easter, which is obviously biggest Sunday of the year, there have been three other Sundays when we've had 800 or more people across the three services. So that it feels like something that, that could easily be a possibility in the next 12 to 18 months. No guarantees, none, none at all. You know, we're not certainly not guaranteed to continue along the same path that we've been on, but we are trying to be as um, proactive as we can, at least, again, making 
creating awareness for everybody of, of what potentially could be. So that would be a, a, a future, maybe we'd call that, I don't know, medium-term future tension for us. When we, when we begin to bump that 800 number consistently, what would be a next step? And I don't necessarily know what that is. Our staff, our admin team, we don't necessarily know what that is. We're trusting the Lord. Our history is God gives us what we need every time we need it. If you were with us on the square, every time we started bumping up against the limits of, a, of our current space, another storefront opened. We never prayed for that because that would have been praying for somebody to go out of business but the Lord always gave it to us. And so we're just trusting that whatever that next thing is, at the moment when we need it, he'll make it apparent. And I would invite you to begin to pray about that. I'll circle back to that here in a little bit. Currently, there are some current tensions that we're feeling. And on Monday night, this is when Emily Massey, our children's director, shared, and Jeremy Morris, our student pastor, shared, and Matt Nelson, our adult discipleship pastor, shared. And I'm gonna try to summarize their thoughts. And I would encourage you, to reach out to them directly again if, if you have anything that you would want to clarify or ask. It's just their first name, Emily, Jeremy, Matt, at Stonebridge, Marietta.org. I would say, if, if you asked directly and said, is our building too small? Bottom line it for me. I would say it's too small sometimes. And that, and the kids, the children, feel that the most. There have been, last week, it was fine. Two weeks before that, totally fine. There were times in September and in, in August when it honestly, it was too small. There were times on the nursery hall, we had one, one Sunday we had 26 kids, 26 one-year-olds at 930, which is just, it's just too many at that time in the, in the room that we have. There, we've had some times where on the elementary hall at 930, we, we've, just, we've had almost too many to, to gather together for large group worship. And so there, again, is the building too small? Most of the, n not always, but there are times, and again, I would say our children feel it the most. The, the younger the person, the less flexible they are. And so that's, they, they feel the, the space tension uh, most acutely, and they usually feel it first. And so again, super practically, you can see on the screen behind me, we have more children coming at 930 than we do at 8 and at 1115 combined. And so if you're a 930 family, we would ask you, again, prayerfully to consider either shifting earlier or later. And I would encourage you to reach out to Emily and she can tell you if your family doing that would help based on the ages. But, it, but in general, the answer is yes, it would. And, it, and it's not just about, oh, it would help the church. It would honestly, in some cases, be better for your child, smaller class sizes, more personalized ministry. We believe discipleship happens best along relational lines. And so um, there are times where it's, it's, it's so full for the kids' areas, it's difficult to do the type of ministry that they would desire to do. So again, I would encourage you to reach out to Emily if you have some questions about that. But really practically, if you come at 930, I would just ask you to pray about shifting. And just side note, if you come at 930, I don't want you to feel guilty about that. You know, we're not, we're not trying to do that we want you, what the service that's kind of collectively, you would say, this is the one that works for us. And I'm asking, could another one work for you as well? Would you at least be willing to pray and ask that question? For our students, they actually have enough room. They actually have plenty of room. And the reason they have plenty of room is because they use this whole building on Sunday night. You may or may not know our student ministry meets in this room on Sunday night. They come in Sunday afternoon and do a little mini makeover, moving chairs and trying to make it a feel a bit more like a youth space, and then they set the whole thing back up on Sunday night, So, it, or when youth is over on Sunday night. So it's labor intensive, but they do have the space. The, kind of the pinch point is it, it, is it, it, it creates for the, for the rest of us. Um, outside of Sunday morning, Sunday night is the best time for a worship service, but we can't do that because our students take up all of the space on Sunday, both the worship room and they take up all of the children's rooms for their small groups, we couldn't do a Sunday night service if we wanted to. And that's something that we have considered, but it's a, it's a no-go right now. So again, there's, there's plenty of room for the students, but it's because they have the whole church on Sunday night. So on Wednesday night during their Bible study, they are a bit pinched. Uh, they, have, they, can have, they have had up to 70 kids coming for a Bible study, which is incredible, but it does make it a little bit more difficult for them to do what they want, which is an interactive um, discussion 
but they're doing the best they can to, to kind of modify that. But again, so Jeremy would say that would be the biggest pinch point for students. It's not necessarily pinching them, but it's a way they maybe pinch the rest of us. And then for the adults, if I'm capturing Matt's thoughts uh, accurately, I think what Matt would say is it's really a feel thing. Like we, we do have room. Most Sundays we have room. It may not be the most comfortable seat, but most Sundays there, there is a seat and there's certainly always seats at eight. But there are times where it, it may be the feel of rapid growth in a short period of time. It, and you may have experienced this is some people don't feel known uh, people don't necessarily feel seen and known on a Sunday um, because of the number of people and the number of new people, and that may be you. Uh, over the last three years, average or total, you know, 312 new people on a Sunday. That's, that's a lot. And so because of that, some of the relational connections maybe are becoming, uh, uh, I don't know, afraid is the right word, maybe a bit more difficult to establish and maintain. And so what Matt was encouraging us to do on um, Monday night was really simple. He was just saying, say hello to the people you're sitting with. That sounds so maybe trivial or, or elementary, but it's, it's genuine. Just to say hello, recognizing that we're all trying to connect with one another. I've been here, you know, as long as anybody, and there's plenty of people that I haven't met yet. And so I, I would be certain that's the case for you. And I would just encourage you and Matt would encourage you and say, trying to create a place where people feel welcome, an easy step is just saying hello to somebody. It doesn't matter if they've been here for one, one day or, or 10 years. If, if you haven't met them, then they're new to you. And so just saying hello uh, will actually make a big difference in the overall culture of our church and the atmosphere, what people feel on Sunday. If people don't feel welcomed it, by the body, it's difficult for them to open up to the Lord because, you, and, and maybe you've experienced that, just not feeling settled can make it difficult to hear from and respond to him. And something as simple as a hello or a sliding over to create a space for somebody, those small gestures can help people feel at ease and make it easier for them to connect with the Lord, which is ultimately uh, what we want. So kids, I would say, they're, they're feeling it. There are Sundays where the building is too small for them. And the most practical thing we can do is looking at shifting from 930 to either 8 or 1115. Students, they've got plenty of room. They take up the whole building on Sunday night, which means one of the things that we may want to do to create more space, having a Sunday night service, is not on the table. Adults, the, it's, it's more of a feel thing than anything else. We would, I would say as adults, you know, this doesn't sound great, but we kind of think about you last. You're the most flexible. And so um, we, can, we can figure out how to find a place for you, even if it's not the best seat in the world, up to 390 times three. But we would say, let's, let's make sure that we're creating an atmosphere where everyone who comes in feels known, where everybody's getting a, hey, glad you're here, What's your name? You know, my name's David kind of deal. So after all of that, Mark Hunt, who was speaking on behalf of our admin team, we just wanted to share some things that we've been thinking about. Some of you are solution-oriented, and maybe you're already trying to think of, have y'all thought of this and have you thought of that? And I do want you, if you have an idea, I want you to send it to me directly. Uh, and maybe something that we've considered and maybe something that we haven't. But I do want to say, here's some things that we've thought about that either for you would say, okay, well, they've already thought about that or maybe that gets your juices flowing a little bit. There's some things that we've done, we would call them tweaks, some things that weren't super disruptive. They were kind of behind the scenes. We added uh, 40 chairs in here in November when we moved, in November of 2022. When we moved in, we didn't know that we'd be able to do that. We thought 350 was the max, but it turns out we could get some more and we did that. Uh, we did some things to try to balance the services. When we had two, we were just doing the middle school pullout at 11, and then we started doing it at nine as well to try to create some opportunity there for people with middle school uh, kids to maybe shift earlier. Um, we added the third service. This Going into this school, school year, we added full children's ministry at that eight o'clock to try to make that a service that maybe would be more attractive uh, to family. So all of those things, and those are all on the screen, really intended to either maximize the space that we have or to balance the services, which is another way of saying maximize the space that we have. But we've also done some things that were pretty significant, and our admin team has really led the way in this, and it's been primarily around staffing. 
Again, those, those numbers are real. As, as more people have, have uh, said Stonebridge is my church, as more people are coming consistently on a Sunday, it requires more pastoral leadership, it requires more support, and it requires more organizational and operational leadership. And you can see the positions that we've, hi- that we've uh, added over the last several years. And honestly, that's just, it's, it's your generosity that allows us to do that. All of those people are part-time or full-time, and, and y'all's consistently generous giving has enabled us to do that. Our, our hope is that as we've grown, I hope that you feel, continue to feel well cared for, well loved, and well discipled. And that's not completely a staff thing. Our staff, no, we, we can't hire enough people to care for the size church we have. Primarily, that care is gonna come through small groups uh, and that discipleship happens best in that relational environment of a small group. But hopefully our staff is providing the support um, that our small group leaders need and that, that you need at those times when you reach out to us. So all that to say, we, the admin team's leading the way in terms of making sure that we're adequately staffed for the size church that we have. Uh, we haven't wanted to focus exclusively on you know, a, a building. We've tried to maintain an outward look, trying to maintain ministry, I would say. I hope, hopefully this would be your testimony and experience as well as that the level of ministry has continued or has increased. I don't think we've pulled back. We've done some things like giving. You know, we, we historically have given 10% of the money that's come through the, the boxes on a Sunday, uh, the money that's given, uh, we increase that to 12%. So hopefully we're, we think <laughs> we're being more generous than we've been in the past. Um, we've created a residency program with the idea of trying to invest more intentionally and significantly in either future worship leaders or future church planters. Um, we have set aside some money, $500,000, just in case something becomes apparent that we need to do in terms of a building. And I know that's kind of a drop in the bucket, but it is a, it's a drop. And so we just wanted to have some ready cash if something became available um, building-wise, whatever that might be, that we could move on it uh, quickly. And so, again, thanks to your generosity, we've been able to do those things. I hope what you're hearing in that is, you know, we're not just, we're not hoarding money. We're also, we're not wringing our hands. We're trying to continue to be generous. We're trying to continue to invest in people. And we're trying to be, we're trying to be wise, recognizing we could be coming to a, a decision point, maybe sometime even within the next 12 to 18 months. And, and there's lots of things that we've thought about. And again, maybe these are some things you're wondering, hey, have you guys looked at this? And that list is on the screen as well. I'm going to try to find it here just to make sure I check everything because there might be some things you're not exactly sure about. You know, when um, it's now called the Enlightened Christian Center, when it was World Changers and it was for sale, that was something that we looked at and we talked to them and then it, it didn't work out. We looked at another church up the street that was for sale several years ago, Kennesaw Avenue Missionary Baptist, and we thought that might be a great place for our students, and then that didn't work out. They decided they didn't want to sell. We've looked at um, purchasing some property on Tower Road, uh, maybe for parking, and then we decided not to do that, and we found some more parking at Wells Fargo, and you know, at one point, Trayton, who we have a great relationship with, we talked about, well, is that... Is that a building? They have some space. Should we try to rent that for our students? Obviously, we haven't done any of those things. They haven't worked out. But those are all things that we have explored, trying to say, let's be proactive and prayerful and see where the Lord is working. Kind of one of our ideas is it's easier to steer a moving ship. And so we've taken some steps just to see, okay, God, are, are you in this? Is this something that we need to pursue. And up to this point, most of the answers have been, no, you don't need to do that, which is totally great. That's our history as well. We looked at multiple things over multiple years when we were on the square. And then when we weren't looking for this, it was dropped into our lap lap again as, as one of those good gifts. And so we're trusting that if there is a time where we need to do something more significant, God would make that um, really plain to us in the moment. So last thing, and then uh, Russell Marshall actually would have come up and, and shared at this point as well. What's in some people's mind is church planting, and we are committed to church planting, and Russell and his wife Megan um, are committed to, to church planting. A, a local congregation 
in what he's calling the foreseeable future. They don't have a timeline. He's gonna do our pastoral residency again in 2025. But they are committed to that. And I would say we want to plant churches out of vision. We wanna see our community transformed and more local congregations are helpful and I would say even necessary in seeing that vision accomplished. We don't necessarily wanna plant churches to say let's free up more seats on a Sunday. That's not necessarily out of vision. So that's not a great reason to plant a church. And honestly, our history as a church planting network is it, that planting churches doesn't solve capacity issues. It just, it just doesn't. And so I would say let's separate those, those two things. We've got some tensions around capacity and we want to be prayerfully saying, God, how, what, what's best? What does stewardship look like? And we want to be a church that plants churches. And right now, the best I can tell on October 9th at 7.57 in the morning is it, Russell and Megan will be kind of next in line planting a local church in the foreseeable future. And I would encourage you to begin to pray for them and to ask the Lord, is there, is there a way you would want me to connect with Russell? And you can reach out to him directly, Russell at stonebridgemarietta.org and, and just say, hey, I'm, I'm praying and I would love to grab coffee with you and hear more about your heart or you get to know me more or just keep me, keep me on the list. Maybe that's as far as you're willing to go right now. We're not asking for any commitments, but some level of intentionality around asking the Lord. Now, one thing that could be different with what Russell and Megan do, um, it, it may feel a bit more like a campus. So I'm not super excited about planting a campus with a video screen. Uh, that doesn't at this point, that'd be a really big step for me to be comfortable doing that. I feel like ministry is best done incarnationally. I'm not criticizing anyone who does a video. That's the right thing for some. I just don't know that it's the right thing for us. I don't, I don't love the idea of being me or whoever being projected on a screen. But if we had live preaching in something that was maybe a campus feel, and the, the ministry that was coming out of that campus was based on the neighborhood that campus was in and not something being driven by me or by the people here in, on Tower Road, but that campus maybe was receiving a bit more financial support or operational support for a longer period of time, I think I'd be okay with that. And again, at some point, that doesn't, that's not really a campus. That's, more a, that's a congregation that's receiving more support and that, that certainly makes me feel more comfortable. And any of you who've heard Russell, he doesn't need me on a video screen. He's a gifted and anointed teacher in his own right. And so just if you're wondering about, well, you know, what about a campus that is a solution that a lot of churches have um, moved to? At this point, that's a difficult step for me. I, I wouldn't want to say never. I wouldn't say my conviction is that strong. But I would say at this point, not necessarily likely, primarily because of my picture of effective ministry needing to be um, incarnational and kind of locally driven. So all that to say, those are some things that we've been thinking about in terms of potentially working through this tension point. We're actively pursuing church planting, and that's the piece I would love to see y'all praying about kind of front burner and I would say whenever you think about the church, I would encourage you to pray about this bigger tension as well. Again, recognizing it's two good gifts. God gave us this building and I believe God's giving us these people. And so we want to steward all of that well. He knows what he's doing. And so we wanna keep in step with him. We believe God speaks to the body through the body. And so it very well may be that you have an idea that we haven't thought of. You, God may put something in your heart that he hasn't yet put in ours. And so just let me know, david at stonebridgemarietta.org, and I'll be happy to reply to that. And if nothing else, it just it gives us more things to kind of ponder and chew on and, and think through. So again, we're, I'm not worried. This is not hand-wringing. The sky's not falling. It, it, it's none of those things. This is a, a wonderful place to be in when we're trying to figure out before the Lord how to best steward the good gifts that he's given to us. And I hope that's what you heard if you hung in there for the length of this talk. So I'm gonna say a prayer and then um, that'll be that. God, I am grateful and we are grateful for the gift of this building and for the gift of every single child and student and adult 
who comes through these doors on a Sunday. We're so grateful for both. And we want to steward all of that well before you. And so we submit to you, Jesus, as the head of this church and say, show us. Show us what's next. We wanna pray particularly for Russell and Megan as they're actively and intentionally praying about a church plant. My prayer is that you'd be stirring the hearts of people in our congregation to connect with them, to come alongside them, to form a family, that whatever the next thing is, that they would be doing that next thing together. And so let it be. And I pray that you would then raise up another church planter and another church planter and that we would be a church who is, that's just part of our regular operating rhythm is sending out these new communities uh, for the sake of transforming this region. So let it be so in Jesus' name, amen. Thank y'all.